Hello. Forgive the not shaven mustache isn't as dapper as I would like, but uh, I'm about to be doing some really <laughs> hot and messy and not so caring about uh, personal appearance <laughs> worthy things. Because today I am doing another round of Raku. So Raku firing is uh, there's a couple different types. Um, the Japanese type is a completely different thing and can make food safe stuff and even that's really a mar remarkable to me. Uh, but this process that I'm going to be doing today in probably two, three videos or more uh, is uh, not food safe. Not There's really nothing you can do. I've seen a couple of people say that they've found ways to, to do food safe raku this way. Uh, but no, I, I've never seen anything that's actually safe. Uh, if you know of anything, let me know. Uh, but I, I, I haven't seen anything that was good. The reason for that is a couple of things. One, uh, the type of, of uh, glaze that you're using very frequently will crack, like you see on this crackle kind of glaze here. Um, that's not the only thing they can do, uh, but that is something that happens quite frequently. What that does is it opens the glaze to the clay body, which allows uh, bacteria to grow in it after foodstuffs have been in there for very long. Uh, other problems very frequently are that um, a lot of the chemicals that they use in some of these are going to leach out with food. Uh, not a not a good thing, <laughs> especially if they can be toxic kinds of chemicals. You definitely don't want that in your food. Um, so you got to be really careful. But the real thing that you want to do with Raku is that it is fantastically gorgeous. Typically, if you do it even vaguely good enough, it's still really, really cool stuff, I think. Um, I am no expert. I'm still, I bought my own kiln because I wanted to do a lot more of it, uh, but I, <laughs> I'm i still practicing, still getting things right. And in fact, this is one of the ones that I did um, with Raku the first time I fired, and it looks great. Yeah, it's got some really great colors and everything, but this is what happens when you take the tongs to it before it is... Uh, <laughs> cooled out of the, the kiln just a little bit in order to uh, more or less solidify the stuff. You got to be careful with it. Um, so that is why it's my water bowl. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely I always have to make sure you, I, I suggest something that I don't really do, but I probably ought to start doing. Uh, but I would suggest if you ever do ceramic work, that will be Raku. I would suggest making uh, a marking on the bottom of it that specifies that it is Raku so that if you forget which ones were done with the Raku process at some point, uh, you can look at it and go, okay, whoa, well, no, don't use this as a soap, soup bowl or whatever. Um, and it helps your, if you're selling them, it helps your customers keep track of that too. Um, but I don't really do that much because I'm not selling them and I'm making them mainly for practice for me uh, but for also demo stuff for my students. Unfortunately just after I was getting just about the time I was getting set up with my my kiln that I bought for myself the university I work for doesn't have uh, a kiln for Raku so I bought one for myself just because it's freaking awesome and I wasn't about to let that go without access. But then this whole COVID thing happened. <laughs> so we had to send everybody home and I fired what little we had had the chance to make with a couple of my students uh, beforehand. Some fabulous stuff. Um, and unfortunately, they haven't even had the chance to get, pick them up, but they are beautiful. Um, the, <laughs> the pieces you see back here that are all finished, all four of those, are actually from one of my other students. Uh, Kayla Henry is her name, and she was uh, 
gracious enough to allow me to take video of this process with using hers as part of the, the uh, firing. Um, and I'm including this glazing here uh, with it because, quite frankly, I think everybody should see her work. She is really fantastically talented and getting better and better every time she gets on the wheel, which sadly doesn't happen as often as I would love to see. But, you know, that's what happens when you're a college student, right? So, uh, you couldn't really see it when I did that, but the reason I was sponging off the three uh, pieces just now is that they've been bisque fired for a while and they've been sitting around in my uh, garage and if you've watched pretty much any of my other videos at this point it seems like uh, you'll you'll know what else I do at this table <laughs> and that's usually using things like this to make ridiculous amounts of dust and it is anything but a good idea to have that on your uh, your ceramic work when you put glaze on it. One of the things it can do is uh, kind of slough off when it gets uh, into the kiln. Uh, I'm more familiar with what it'll do with uh, uh, electric kilns, but what I've seen with that frequently is it'll just kind of slough off and slide off instead of making a glazed coating on it. That's not fun stuff. It can totally mess up what you had in mind. So. I'm going to let them dry because I don't want them wet either. Uh, they're just damp right now, but I'd rather them be as bone dry as I can get when I get to the point of glazing them. But this guy has been inside, so he's not terribly dirty. Okay, <laughs> just speckles in the clay. I thought I was lying to you for a second there. Um, but again, this is a guy that I started uh, just before this whole COVID thing. And unfortunately, that means that I ended up starting it at the art studio at the university. Uh, and then they kicked us off campus for safety, of course. You know, good call. Uh, but it meant that I had to pack him up and drag him back to my house in my car, which meant that he ended up getting damaged in the transport. It's never a, it's never a good idea to transport greenware if you can help it, especially since he was not even fully in greenware. I was still constructing him. So I it ended up creating a bit of a fracture through his hand. Granted, it was also a little bit thicker in there than I, I would have liked, but it was really that I, I created a fracture by moving him and jostling that. And his foot snapped off. But I'll, I can glue these back in, on afterwards. Um, it's really just for me. This is going to be a, a centerpiece for my uh, like tiki-themed uh, dining area and he'll have a little shell in his hand for like sliced lemons and things like that and a cup in this hand so that he can put I can put other uh, foodstuffs um, you know food like toothpicks or whatever things that are, are oh, good for use for food will go into the vessels but not him um, I'm going to put straws in here but only when they're dry and clean them up before I do anything with them actually as straws. So we'll have these spiked out uh, bamboo head things. But anyway, uh, but none of the food stuff is actually going to be on him because that's, of course, a, a big no-no. So unfortunately, I don't have brown uh, for an undercoat that I wanted to use for him. So I'm going to have to do, make do with uh, some black I've got underglaze, and typically I would say not to use uh, underglaze on a Raku um, because it's not really meant for the fast heating and cooling that Raku does. Um, they... I don't know <laughs> how many people actually use them that way normally and how well it works for them. That's the only reason I wouldn't suggest it. But I'm going to be using it as a really... Um, like a, a basically antiquing. I'm going to put some on thinly and then wipe it off. Speaking of thinly, I want to get another small vessel and water some of my glaze down. Well, I don't want my dead rabbit skull and bones. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of my water. Oop, I said a little bit, not a whole lot. Okay, 
a little bit. And then I'm going to water down some of my black. So I want to, I basically am just going to be kind of doing subtle colors to, to him for the most part. Uh, I don't really want it to be terribly, um, I, I don't want it to be terribly obnoxious coloring or anything like that. Um, I really just kind of want to accentuate the sculpture and its uh, details. Come on. Don't want to cooperate? I shall force you. And I should have shaken this beforehand, because now I'm going to have to either carefully shake it or mix it by hand, because it's been sitting on a shelf too long. Let's see how shaking it works. I hate that that has a hole in it because I know that's going to make a mess. We shall see. Get back in there. You can do this. All right. Get ready for a mess. <laughs> says as he carefully opens it in case it does. All right, now I'm going to pour just a little bit of that into my water. It's just a, you know, quarter inch or so deep in the bottom of this bowl. This was another experiment. I was using uh, a type of glaze that is intended for low fire, cone O5, and said it could uh, work just fine going up to cone 5, which if you don't know anything about temperatures for uh, ceramic stuff, then that's going to be totally alien to you and that's no big deal. Um, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of a lot of temperature <laughs> difference. And unfortunately, what it ended up doing is not terribly attractive in my opinion. Uh, they were supposed to bloom out and look really nice and I was hoping it would run but I didn't really like the way it looked after all so it was worth a good shot at uh, seeing what it would do, what it would look like but I didn't like it all that much so it's yeah another one of those that I'll just have in the garage and mess with and let it just get messed up if it wants to. All right. So what I'm going to do is take this thinned down under glaze. I'm going to paint a bunch of that across it. But then I'm immediately going to take my sponge to it and pull the surface stuff back off. Like that. So it's going to leave mostly... I'm not really washing it off. I'm just kind of taking the surface stuff off. So it's, it's going to leave the uh, pigment down in the crevices better and all the nice details that I spent so much time sculpting are all going to show up better because of that contrast. But hopefully it's not going to be too obnoxious. And hopefully, since I've never tried this before, it's not going to be a, an atrocious, terrible thing that pieces start flaking off or something really terrible like that. But we'll see. I kind of doubt it will, otherwise I wouldn't be recording me <laughs> doing all this. But it wouldn't be the first time that I took a lot of chances and tried things and it turned out to be a disaster. I made a, a scorpion bowl uh, a few months ago. Uh, that it, these are the the novelty drink things that look like a volcano in the middle and have a little fire in it. Um, they often call them volcano balls too. Uh, but I made one of them, and quite frankly, I, it looked really cool. It was really nice. And then I got all experimenty with the glaze. <laughs> and it turned into garbage really quickly. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I even used one of those, one of these low fire on it um, that said it could go to higher fire mid range that I was firing it at. And it ended up flowing down onto the kiln shelf and I had to do a bit of cleanup as well as the sticking of that to the kiln shelf broke off some of the foot of my vessel. So it was literally garbage really quickly. I threw it right out because it was not useful in the slightest at all. Not that brush. Ended up dripping too much down deep down into a crevice down here so I'm just gonna use this to pull some of that out of it. But it's already getting, you can't see this side, but um, it's already getting a bit darker, a little more rustic kind of feeling, which is kind of what I want. But I don't want to go too dark, so I'm trying to pull quite a bit of it off. The cool thing about this is that the, the sponge won't get into the finest little detail areas, so it's almost like an automatic shading, too, if I don't go crazy with it. Um, either crazy with this or crazy with that, uh, then it won't be too bad. I usually love the way it looks when you do this stuff, so I wanted to make sure I did it and you could see me do it. Not the, not the best brush for this. <laughs> These are usually for doing really good coatings on bowls and things like that. Um, does a fantastic job of that, of course, but getting into the, the details of this kind of thing without being able to manipulate them can be difficult, to say the least. Let me just hung and I'll do that separately. I sculpted that separately with the hopes of putting a, a battery-powered tea light into his head, uh, but I, in my rush to do all this, I sort of failed to remember how much this clay shrinks. So my tea light won't fit in there anymore. <laughs> so a little customization to an electric tea light might be in order pretty soon. Now if I do this right, I should be able to uh, wipe a little bit more off of the teeth and not as much around it so that you get a bit of a, a very subtle hint of uh, like white teeth without them actually being white. But um, what I'm probably going to do is I have a Raku uh, clear that I'm probably going to put on basically all of them so that it doesn't uh, get the <laughs> just completely carbon coated uh, with the fire process. Um, one of the processes that I'll show you in that video when I make it is that, of course, you put it into a reduction chamber, trash can uh, in this case, and uh, it's in there with combustible materials like I'm going to grab some leaves out of my yard and things like that. And of course, it's in there burning because when you put this stuff in there with it, it is it's such a high temperature, it immediately starts to combust all the stuff in there. So you cover it up and, it, and let the stuff burn. And the carbon that comes off of that burning ends up getting into all the open pores of the clay. And that's one of the big reasons that uh, you can't use it for food is because all those pores are still open and you end up uh, getting that carbon filling up, well, going into them. I couldn't say totally filling them up, as I was about to. Uh, but it goes into all of those little nooks and crannies that are microscopic into the clay. And boy, is that hard to get in there. Gosh darn, I'm gonna ruin my brush just trying to get it in there. Um, so yeah, it, it fills up as much as it can anyway. The 
little microscopic holes in the clay and turns it black like the bottom of the bubble like I was just showing you here. Maybe I can't turn it too much. Why am I even trying? <laughs> anyway, so yeah. I'll stop babbling and get this over with. So it's not such a slow, painful video. And I promise I'm not just gonna paint stuff on the backside where you can't see it. I would pick it up. If it were a bowl, I'd have it in my hand and be rotating it like crazy all the time anyway. But um, speaking of, I don't want this splattering over on those. Um, but he's a little bit more awkward, so I'm not doing that. I wish I had different brushes for this. I have a handful over there I might even break down and use, but I've used them for watercolor and things before and, and they've been sitting around getting dusty and such. So I don't really trust them that well. But it might be necessary. I'm not bothering with that backside because that's where I'm going to glue it together. It'll get completely blackened uh, by the carbon, but it won't seal up the pores like I was talking about. So the glue will have a little bit better chance of penetrating in, which <laughs> we'll see what kind of glue I end up using with it. But uh, some glues that's good, some glues that's bad. Um, but we'll see what works best for it. The more water I use, the, the more it washes off easier. Uh, so I got to be careful, especially with things that are going to be put together later but are not yet. Uh, it can be really awkwardly mismatched if I'm not careful with it. But on the other hand, I'm not all that concerned with this project looking all nice and even and matched and all that kind of thing because I want it to look uh, pretty you know, rustic, not carefully controlled. Hopefully looking well made but not retentively controlled. We'll see. <laughs> We'll see how that works. And he's a little heavy. brush and get down in there because my sponge is probably not going to reach a whole lot of that. I'm not too worried about my table getting messy. Because obviously I don't usually care about that too much to begin with, uh, but this stuff will just wipe off pretty easily.
doing it extra wet up here so that it'll run down into those crevices that I've created with my sculpting tool. And hopefully settle a little bit of that pigment into those crevices, creating a little bit of artificial shading. Okay, I'm gonna have to get to a different angle here. So let's start wiping stuff off first while I still can reach this side. I'm probably going to use a different wash of um, a different underglaze on the lay so that it'll look a little bit like flower petals or something. Um, now I kind of wish I had green now that I think about it because it would have been really nice to have that as basically leaves instead. A little less tourist obvious about it. Um, but that's okay. I've got a kind of a candy apple red and a flame orange cream kind of color I think is what this one is. Sorbet. So it's a kind of a pale orange. So not the best of a variety of colors but yeah it, we'll get there. We'll get there. Underglaze normally doesn't stick to kiln shelves uh, unless you get it really thick or something like that. Um, pretty nice stuff, mainly because it's it's uh, kind of acting a little bit like a stain. Uh, if it's thin, it's not a stain, not the same thing, but it acts a little bit like that. Um, So it just kind of goes into the pores a lot more than a glaze normally does. It'll The glaze will do that, but it'll also create a coating that's thick enough to glaze it, make a coating of glass over the outside of it, which is what glaze is. Okay. Rearrange stuff so I can turn him around. Should have grabbed my turntable. It's just over there. That would have made life a little easier, huh? Oh well. Okay, sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. I think of that song a lot. <laughs> Making artwork. <laughs> And of course I made it so you can't see a thing that I'm doing right now, but I'm basically painting the inside of his nose. I gave him a, <laughs> a hole through here, not because I'm going to give him a bone or something terribly culturally inappropriate, uh, but because I wanted him to actually <laughs> be a little bit like a self-portrait. So I'm going to hang a, a thick mustache from him if I can ever get myself to sculpt and fire one. Because I'm just hipster enough to think my mustache is fun. I've almost never used that brush before, and I am totally going to destroy it using it. <laughs> not like this. Not, 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 the, not the right way to do that. <laughs> this brush technique. I should be using something else. But that's the difference between teaching and doing the stuff for yourself for real art. <laughs> you typically teach as best as you can for the proper way to do things and then you end up going back to your your art studio and doing things wrong anyway uh 
but sometimes that's because the quote unquote proper way to do things uh, work well for intro and learning how to do things um, and breaking those rules don't work out terribly well normally for when you're just starting to learn things. Uh, so you don't want to run any risks that way. Um, but after you get used to things a little better, you can start experimenting and trying different things. And you're better with the materials and the tools. So you can, can usually get away with a little bit less retentive control and uh, holding to the proper way to do things. So it's still usually a better idea to do the proper way. Uh, that's still true, usually. But you never, you never really learn anything or expand upon your basic uh, intro level stuff if you never experiment. So I'm all, you'll find me experimenting with new ideas all the time. It's one of the reasons I went to sculpture instead of ceramics. I was a ceramics major for a little while when I was an undergrad uh, for a good couple of years or so and never really wanted to be a ceramicist. Uh, I just wanted to make ceramic sculptures when I was there. Um, so I was still in ceramics, but I was really just fooling myself. I wanted to be a sculptor because I really quickly found that I what I really wanted was the freedom to do whatever I felt like doing with materials and uh, you know the media wasn't so much my obsession it was making the artwork instead so I never did stick to any one specific uh, media caused a lot of problems because uh, it meant that I didn't really have a whole lot of focus because it takes a heck of a lot longer uh, time to develop what kind of thing you do as an artist uh, and if you have the focus of what you do is more focused on being really good with a specific material and it, it, that can make it easier uh, easier to develop your aesthetic because you're focusing on being better and better and better with that one type of material and it kind of develops along with you uh, whereas not having any focus on a specific material, a media, uh, makes it really difficult to uh, to really to let it happen so organically like that. You, you kind of, at least I found that it more or less made me uh, be a lot more philosophical about what kinds of things I was doing. I became terribly philosophical when it, when I was in school, uh, especially. In grad school, I got way too philosophical about the things I was doing, and uh, I was the only one that had any access to all, any of the stuff that I was talking about in my artwork, so it didn't really make any difference to anybody, and nobody wanted to read, you know, thousands of pages of post-humanism just to understand what I was I was working with. Um, so it, it became, in a way kind of very pretentious but also not so because of the kinds of things i was trying to do with it instead it just didn't come across very well but that's okay all that time i was just denying my real purpose for art the whole passion the reason i feel like i want to make artwork and that's to have fun making monsters really to be totally honest about it it's all about monsters for me it always has been anyway i need to stop talking and just do it but i know silence gets really terrible watching a video of somebody just sitting there derp 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 and hearing my chair creak and that's it that can be terrible i know Get in there. There. <laughs> Smack him with it. <laughs> that might work. <laughs> it did too. Get a smaller brush and put some in there. 
but for now, start wiping stuff off. Every time I record, somebody wants to get a hold of me. Hello again. I ran out of batteries that time. That was a legit reason. But this guy's ready to go. I just need to set him to the side and let him finish drying. That won't be a problem. It'll be dry long before I get the Raku stuff set up. But in the meantime, I'm also going to glaze these pots or vessels. I don't, you know, I don't know what my little silliness that there is, what you'd ever even call that. But these two figured, oh, I've got Northern Lights and Sunspot here. Uh, and I can never remember which one turns out in what way. And the, the color samples that you see online are anything but helpful for that. <laughs> they look almost identical to me. One just has a little bit more texture than the other one. Um, but I think I'm going to use Sunspot on the inside of this. Let me just do Sunspot on the whole thing. I have a textured one somewhere too. But anyway. I want to make it, you can see how fast it dries up because these, this thing is so thirsty. It's pulling the moisture out of it really fast. So that means it's going to paint on pretty thickly, which is good. Uh, it could be really cool stuff that way. But it is also really good because it means it's less likely to to get rid of the sh shiver, to get the uh, the glaze to fall off as you're firing it or something. Raku is usually not all that bad about that anyway, but it's always nice to see good bisque being real thirsty. Now I'm trying to make sure I get really carefully up in into this, um, but then I'm going to clean off the edge of this one with a sponge. Uh, because I don't want any of this color on the outer side of my foot either. Just because I like don't like it on the outside is all. No good reason otherwise. I'd rather it be nice and black. Not so much folklore monsters as I usually do, huh? But as a, an artist, I'm all over the place. I'm not much of an expert ceramicist, as you could probably tell. Anybody who happens to be right now is going, oh my god, even out your brush strokes, you jerk. <laughs> and don't put your thumb in the wet glaze. That, that, that would be helpful. It's usually best to be as smooth as you can get, as even coated as you can do, uh, because that'll let the variance be due to the temperature changes and the convection of the the uh, kiln itself, instead of you know your sloppy handwork. But. With this kind of glaze, for instance, it is so 
wildly different in all sorts of different it, everything pretty much seems seems like every single factor that you could imagine has some sort of a change that it'll do with it and it's very difficult to predict so uh, it doesn't really seem to make as much difference to me but I still try to go relatively uh, even coats all the way across it and then I'll do a second coat so that it uh, you know, it gets a, a nicer, thicker coat, but also has a better chance of evening out and uh, treating the, temp the coloring better that way, too. I'll do a thicker rim here for, for a minute, just because that tends to be a bit thin. back and do another one of those here in a minute but I want to finish my second coat on the inside real quick this is way faster than the sculpture isn't it <laughs> that took forever but this is almost done whoa what's that It's not good. Looks like I've got bits of partially dried glaze in there. Somebody's left my glaze open a little too long. It looks like made kind of like a skin on the top or something. Even after I shook it, they're coming back. Need to talk to some folks about borrowing my glaze if they're going to be like that. more in the bottom here carefully blend it out to the rest as best I can then like I said let's do a little more around the rim stuff here. And then I'm going to do another around the top or edge of this just because I kind of want to get two different thicknesses. Do a thin one towards the bottom, thicker, thicker towards the top here and just kind of blend it in a little. Um, mainly just because I want to see what the differences are between the two. And when this is on display, <laughs> uh, when this is on display, uh, you're not going to be able to see this side very well anyway. I'm probably going to hang it on a wall or something by a, you know, like that kind of thing. So it's going to be out looking at you that way. Um, if I can get one strong enough to hold on, I may have to custom make something. So the backside's not going to be all that big a deal, comparatively. You'll see a little bit as your side to side to it, but it won't be as interesting as the inside anyway. So next, let's set you to the side, along with Mr. Tiki Guy, and... Why not? I've got sunspot open. Let's do this one that way too. Oh, I didn't spawn that off. I'll have to do that here in a minute. Oh, hmm. got a little drip of my uh, 
Looks like I splashed a little of my black underglaze thin down water on it. So we'll see what that does. Probably not much. This is going to cover it up pretty heftily, I imagine. This time around is just trying to get it up underneath that kind of lip kind of area underneath the foot or above the foot really if you're looking at it right side up. So I'm not terribly worried about what it looks like on the rest of the foot or what the rest of the vessel I mean. <laughs> Staring at the foot thinking about the foot uh, until I get to that edge part finished. I'm not, I wasn't as terribly concerned with how well this was doing, as long as I didn't get it too gloppy. Sometimes it just takes practiced gentle hand. Something that I'm not all that great at, but I do have a fairly controlled delicate touch. So that works out pretty well sometimes. All right, inside, here we come. Last time I did this, I was all sorts of experimental about things. You can tell, you might not be able to tell in that one since I've got water and colors inside of it all the time. Uh, but I did one color on the inside and a different color on the outside and tried to get it all sorts of playful and change things up. Uh, but honestly, it just got a little complicated and didn't really look like it needed to be different. Didn't really work out that well. A little complicated, or uh, conflicted, I mean. The inside and the outside are both kind of fighting for your attention, and so I don't think that was a, as good of an idea. Whereas with just one glaze color, you have a whole lot less problem with that. Just a spot down there. Oh, the top of the foot there, I just now noticed, didn't have any. I'm going to blend that out. So it's not just a glop of color there. Okay, back to the inside here. What I'm doing is just kind of going up like this so that I can get up underneath that slight undercut of the lip and then blending it out a bit and then I'll come back for another coat here in a minute but for now I'm going to try to do that lip get a first coat on that You'll notice in this case I'm going with the rim instead of against it because if you go against it it'll glop stuff up like that. So I'm trying not to do that kind of thing. 
any more than I have to as I go around. All right, let's do another inside coat here. Do a little center. Load this up even more. And then get thick coat so it'll be easier to coat more of it and blend it together better. so I can get the other side. Get quite a bit of glaze in there. There we go. Make sure you get up underneath that evenly. And even it out. Then it's just a matter of doing the lip again. made just a kind of a recessed trough in the lip this time on this one as kind of a, a playful try something different so I thought maybe since it's not going to be used as a, a food vessel I figured it might be something to give me the excuse to play with it and be a little bit more experimental with the shape because this wouldn't be <laughs> wouldn't be the the most beneficial lip shape if you were trying to like you'd make a cup or something and that you wouldn't want this extra that would yeah it'd make it hard to drink probably <laughs> but as a bowl that's not as big a deal having that slight bit of uh over arch undercut to it isn't a bad deal uh because it keeps it from splashing off to the sides like the big bowl i just did is nice and decorative but uh as a like a soup bowl or something it's not the most pleasant because it would just kind of any kind of movement this way just let it slosh out the side because of the long edge slope that just keeps going out And just like the last one, I'm adding a little bit thicker edge. It'll also kind of blend in the top lip that I did. Okay, that should be just about there. Make sure I don't have any thick edges or to glop up or anywhere. Okie dokie. So that one needs to sit to the side and dry too. We're getting close now. Only one more thing to glaze, and it's just a play around kind of thing anyway. Uh, mainly because I, I threw this <laughs> on my piece of junk little $200 wheel at my house that I bought because of COVID. Uh, and I couldn't go into the studio and use a real wheel. And let me tell you, that thing's a piece of junk. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't allow for very good ceramics works. And because it was, it's a little bit off center and and wobbly and things, and it makes it a pain in the butt. So as I was doing that, <laughs> it was starting to go all sorts of wobbly, nasty, and everything. So I'm like, eh, let's just finish it. So that's why it's got this silly, I tried for a crazy spirally kind of edge gloppy. That's my word for today, gloppy, I guess. Um, I've already got this out. Why not? You'll get to see more variety and experimentation with her pieces. So that's not a, not a big deal. And I'll go back and take the sponge to it now that they're probably pretty close to dry that way clean off the glaze at the bottom so it doesn't have any likelihood of sticking down because that's never fun especially in raku <laughs> i thankfully never had to worry about that uh but in raku you're in such a hurry to get things out of there and into the reduction chamber that you can't just let it sit and get stuck and you might end up yanking 
the shelf and everything else falls to the ground and breaks and it's ridiculously hot everywhere and very bad and fire and you know you know everything's bad bad things happen bad things happen in good pottery and sculptures didn't mean to leave my tiki dude out I'm not even going to try to glaze the inside of this one because frankly you're not even going to see it really um, and since it can't be a food vessel it doesn't really matter anyway as far as you know sealing it up because it won't this might but it also probably has some I'm not sure this one might have some chemicals in it that would leak out or leach out I mean um, and cause health problems for food or it may just not seal the clay fully not sure could be lots of different things so I'll get the inside of the rim here and then good gosh didn't cope that very well so that's what the second coat's for. That shall do a lot better job now. Do, do, do. Coat up a piece of junk I'll probably use as a pencil cup out here or something because it's not good. <laughs> If it breaks in the shop, I don't care. <laughs> but hopefully I can make some really pretty stuff on it. We will see how it goes. Gotta, you can see where the dry stuff is. That's just one coat down there. We'll see how that works. Uh, you can probably guess one of my goals for this firing is to see how a single coat works as, as opposed to my standard two coats that tend to be a bit thicker. Who knows? Typically for uh, glazing of any kind, I would suggest having a good couple of coats. Um, really depends on how thick the glaze is to begin with. But this is not terribly thick, uh, but it's not running thin. Super running thin anyway. So, yep, two is probably pretty good. We'll see what happens with the single, with the temperatures, how that treats it. But yeah, I think at this point, it's a matter of cleaning stuff up that you don't really want to watch. And I will start setting up for the Raku, the firing. So I'll see you soon.